Good morning and welcome to City Life Church. We are glad to have you with us this morning. If you are new, welcome. Uh, we're happy to have you worship together with us online. A couple things to point out before we get started. The first, grab your Bibles, either a hard copy or on your phone. Be ready to follow along throughout our liturgy today. Secondly, uh, if you are new to City Life and you have not become a partner uh, with us yet, you have an opportunity to do that coming up soon. We have a, a partners class are offered in, in two phases, uh, two consecutive Sundays. They'll be online via Zoom on July 19th and the 26th. If you are interested in that or you have any questions, you can find information or register at austincitylife.org. So I encourage you to do that if you have not become a partner with us yet. With that, let's jump right in to worshiping our Lord and Savior together this morning. Good morning, City Life. It's great to be with you. Uh, join me for our call to worship. Great is the Lord and abundant in power. We draw near to our God, God whose understanding is immeasurable. The Lord heals the brokenhearted and binds up their wounds. We come to receive his gentle care and gracious restoration. Let us sing praise to the Lord, for it is good to sing praises to our God. Let us sing praise to the Lord, for it is pleasant and he is worthy of all praise. Let's worship him. Death, the God of life, 
And what no grave could e'er restrain him And praise the Lord, he is alive What a foretaste of deliverance How unwavering our hope Christ in power resurrected As we will be when he comes What a foretaste of deliverance How unwavering our hope Christ in power resurrected As we will be when he comes Church, as we continue to worship this morning, as we continue to consider our praise to the Lord, we're going to take a moment to look to how we glorify God and reflect on the truths of the ways that we can give praise to our Lord and Savior. Church, how can we glorify God? We glorify God by enjoying Him, loving Him, trusting Him and obeying His will, commands, and law. These are all good things that we must draw near and cling to as Christ works in and through them. So now let's take some time to reflect on this passage from Deuteronomy. You shall therefore love the Lord your God and keep His charge his statutes, his rules, and his commandments always. Me. 
Cause all my life you have been faithful Yes you have And all my life you have been so, so good With every breath that I am able I will see of the goodness of God Oh, I will sing of the goodness of God. God, we will sing of your goodness. Help us to praise you. Help us to glorify you. Do that by showing us your goodness. Let us see your goodness. Let us see your kindness as we look to your word this morning. Help us to slow down and be formed and shaped by your word, by your statutes, by your commands. Continue to work in us and through us, God, for your glory. Amen. Today's scripture reading is Psalm 147. Praise the Lord, for it is good to sing praises to our God, for it is pleasant, and a song of praise is fitting. The Lord builds up Jerusalem. He gathers the outcasts of Israel. He heals the brokenhearted and binds up their wounds. He determines the number of the stars. He gives to all of them their names. Great is our God and abundant in power. His understanding is beyond measure. The Lord lifts up the humble. He casts the wicked to the ground. Sing to the Lord with thanksgiving. Make melody to our God on the lyre. He covers the heavens with clouds. He prepares rain for the earth. He makes grass grow on the hills. He gives to the beasts their food and to the young ravens that cry. His delight is not in the strength of the horse, nor his pleasure in the legs of a man, but the Lord takes pleasure in those who fear him, in those who hope in his steadfast love. Praise the Lord, O Jerusalem. Praise your God, O Zion. For he strengthens the bars of your gates. He blesses your children within you. He makes peace in your borders. He fills you with the finest of the wheat. He sends out his command to the earth. His word runs swiftly. He gives snow like wool. He scatters the frost like ashes. He hurls down crystals of ice like crumbs. Who can stand before his cold? He sends out his word and melts them. He makes his wind blow and the waters flow. He declares his word to Jacob, his statutes and rules to Israel. He has not dealt thus with any other nation. They do not know his rules. Praise the Lord. This is God's word for us. Thanks be to God. Hello, my name is Peter Craig, and I'm an elder here at City Life Church. And today we're going to be looking at what it means to meditate on the Psalms. And to be honest, I don't always do this that well. I remember sitting down to read Psalm 147 the night before discussing it with my fight club. And verse 1 hit me like a brick wall. It says, Praise the Lord, for it is good to sing praises to our God. For it is pleasant, and a song of praise is fitting. It was late at night. I was in bed, tired, and I read, praise the Lord, with an exclamation point, but everything within me screamed, no, go to sleep. It was clear from verse one that I'd approach God's word unprepared, and to be honest, a little hard-hearted. I wanted to cram, not be changed. I was treating scripture like a chore instead of God's life-giving words to bless me. My lack of humility and concern revealed that I had forgotten in that moment that spending time with God is good for me. 
This is why we need the Psalms. We need to be reminded of God's character, his power, and his love. We need to be confronted in our sin and in a time of pandemic, economic collapse, social unrest, racism, and injustice, we need to be comforted in our sorrows. We need songs and prayers to express our genuine emotions. Whatever you're feeling right now, God wants you to bring it to him and through the Psalms provides, provide words filled with passion and truth to lift back up to him. In short, God wants to bless you. Psalm 1 says, Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the wicked, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of scoffers, but his delight is in the law of the Lord, and on his law he meditates day and night. Maybe delighting in or meditating on God's word seems a little distant to you right now. Maybe you're hurting and have forgotten that spending time with God is, is a good thing, that it's pleasant and fitting to sing praises to him. Maybe it all just sounds like homework to you. Wherever you're at, my hope and prayer is that God speaks to you as we walk through Psalm 147 and examine three aspects of meditation, relationship, humility, and faith. Let's pray. Father, we come to you in need. We need your presence. We need your truth. And so we humbly approach you and ask that you speak to us through your word. Lord, I want to confess my weakness. Lord, I need you. As I preach, I need you to speak to me and through me. Lord, there's so many things that are going on in our world right now, so much hurt, so much confusion, so much in the news, so much in our personal lives. It's hard to turn down that volume and come to you and hear your voice, but we ask, Holy Spirit, that you help us do that. Please, Holy Spirit, help us hear your voice this morning. Thank you for your word. I ask that, Lord, you speak to us and change us for the glory of Christ. Amen. Now, in 1996, astronomers discovered a small patch of black in the night sky, about the size of a grain of sand held at arm's length. This was a void, void of any light, a pinprick of blank space. Out of curiosity, they focused the Hubble Space Telescope on this void for 10 straight days to see what they might find. And when the long exposure was complete, the astronomers discovered three thousand galaxies, each containing over 100 billion stars inside the boundaries of that tiny black dot. Discovery, this, this discovery was jaw-dropping. They attempted this again in 2004 on a very similar size void in space, and they discovered 10,000 more galaxies that they never knew existed. These two images, birthed out of conviction and discipline, change the way we see the universe and ourselves. I believe this is a striking image of what meditating on God's word can look like in our lives. It's staring at something or someone truly great. It's intentionally, patiently, and humbly gazing at God through the lens of scripture until it produces revelation and transformation. So what does meditation look like? Is it a focused Bible study? Is it an intentional time of prayer? Tim Keller says both. He shares if Bible study married prayer, they would have little meditations running around. Meditation is the union of studying God's word and of prayer. It's listening and it's speaking. It's about both being a student and a beloved child. Ultimately, it's about relationship. Know this, God wants to speak to you through his word. He wants to encourage you. He wants to challenge you. He wants to change you. But first, we have to slow down. 
Like Jonathan encouraged us a few weeks ago, we have to be a sailboat. Now, in our culture, this is difficult to do. To do. Personally, I'm wired like a speedboat. More is better. Faster is better. And that mindset often minimizes my day to a list of checkboxes. Morning run, check. Eat breakfast, check. Read Bible, check. When I'm not humbly slowing down, the reward for me is the pat on the back I give myself from having read the Bible, not from having met with God or growing in relationship with him. Is life busy? Absolutely. Even during quarantine, our schedules can fill up with many, many good things. But God wants us to slow down, to slow down and gaze at him, not glance. When I simply glance at God, I miss out on the beauty and sweetness of God. I read biblical facts, not savor life-giving truths, like verses 2 and 3. The Lord builds up Jerusalem. He gathers the outcasts of Israel. He heals the brokenhearted and binds up their wounds. Why is it fitting to lift up songs of praise to the Lord? Because God is loving, tender, and kind to his people. If we slow ourselves down enough, we can hear the Spirit speaking stunning reminders. God gathers. God builds up. These aren't cold facts. These are heartwarming truths. If you recall, Israel was an exiled people, scattered and powerless. Their home, Jerusalem, where God's temple stood, was conquered. But we see here that the Lord desires to unite and restore his people. It's the same for us, his church. During this time of quarantine, we're scattered as a church, and that can often feel isolating and lonely. But God doesn't social distance. He's near and wants to build us up both collectively and personally. He wants to reach down into our dirty, broken lives and bind up our wounds. Take a moment to savor. Take a moment to savor that tenderness, that love. God desires to strengthen his people and draw in those who feel left out. We see the same love and care when Jesus laments over Israel. Listen to his words. How often would I have gathered your children together as a hen gathers her brood under her wings and you were not willing. I don't know about you, but this is someone I want to know, not check off a list. Are you heartbroken right now? Do you feel unheard or unknown? Don't let your pain distance you from God. Slow down and allow the words of the psalm to draw you toward him, to sit at his feet. He wants to heal your wounds and by the power of the Spirit, lead you. As you sit down to meditate on God's word, know this, you are not alone. The author of God's word, the Holy Spirit, desires to guide you in your reading of it. He wants to speak to you. But as one theologian says, only the silent can hear. Oftentimes, it's so tempting to bring our challenge of the moment to Scripture in search of a quick fix. Our feelings and circumstances are shouting over a megaphone while the Spirit is whispering to us through His Word. We're driving the agenda, not the Spirit. Yes, God desires to meet our need, but we can't cling so tightly to it that it dictates our time with him. We must prayerfully surrender ourselves to the leading of the Holy Spirit and listen to him. If you remember one thing, I say this sermon, one thing, let it be this. Before you read God's word, pray. While you read God's word, pray. After you read God's word, pray. One very practical prayer to lift up. Holy Spirit, give me insight into God's word. 
Holy Spirit, give me insight into God's word. By God's grace, he's done this for me through this psalm. Since quarantine began, two of my daughters have been suffering with pretty intense anxiety. It induces fear, sleeplessness, and so many tears. Yes, I get to be near them, but I'm realizing more and more I'm completely powerless to reach in them and heal their broken hearts. But that's not true with God. He's reminded me through this psalm that he's more than able to meet them in their need. Look at verses four and five. He determines the number of the stars. He gives to all of them their names. Great is our Lord and abundant in power. His understanding is beyond measure. At first glance, healing the broken hearts and naming the stars seemed like contrasting ideas to me. But the Spirit has encouraged me to see how these truths work together, that God is both loving and infinitely powerful enough to free my daughters from their anxieties. I shared these verses with my 11-year-old a few weeks ago as tears welled up in her eyes before bedtime. And by God's grace, by God's grace, I could sense her fear shrink in the shadow of God's greatness. Do you know how many stars there are in our universe? Rough scientific estimates believe that our universe has 10 trillion galaxies, each containing at least 100 billion stars. So if you're doing the math at home, that's one septillion stars. That's one with 24 zeros after it. Kids, if you have a piece of paper at home, write that down. One with 24 zeros after it. And he has named every single one of them. God is both powerful and personal. So is he capable of understanding and quenching the anxieties you're facing right now? Yes. His understanding is beyond measure. So don't exclude him as you study his word. Ask the, ask the spirit for help. Humble yourself and ask him to encourage your heart. And verse six remind us, reminds us that the Lord lifts up the humble. He casts the wicked to the ground. So we must humble ourselves and ask for his help. A humble posture is paramount to meditating on God's word. Where humility listens, pride speaks, self-justifies, and hits the gas when it's time to pump the brakes. A prideful person cherry-picks scripture and over time forms her own truth. When she sees something that's challenging, she dismisses it as antiquated, irrelevant, or simply not meant for her. The prideful person doesn't ask questions, he assumes. When he encounters the truth that God casts down the wicked, he often shrugs his shoulders and says, that's not me, and moves on without a second glance. The prideful person touts self-sufficiency and thinks he can check in with God every now and then and be just fine. This is a person that believes that reading the scripture of the day on an app is sufficient. And his heart is fooled into believing that Jesus was simply speaking poetically when he says, man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. Ultimately, the sin of pride, the sin of pride can produce anemic Christians, tired, weak, and without direction. They lack the nutrients of God's word, the, tr the joy of their salvation, and over time, their faith can erode into bitterness and distance from Christ and his people. On the other hand, humility is the fertile soil for the seed of God's word to be cast and bear fruit. A humble person has ears to hear not what, would he, what, not what he wants, but what God desires to reveal. He patiently, not perfectly, but patiently meditates on God's word and is ready to be changed in ways he didn't even know he needed. The humble person approaches scripture and lifts up a very practical prayer. Another prayer. Holy Spirit, reveal my need. 
Holy Spirit, reveal my need. When I laid in bed trying to cram Psalm 147, I needed to be humbled. I didn't ask for it, but by God's grace, that's exactly what the Holy Spirit did. By revealing God's greatness through this psalm, he lovingly diminished the view I had built up of my own greatness and my lack of need. Gazing at God's beauty and power had a sobering effect on my view of self. And by verse 7, I was beginning to get it. Yes, it is good to sing to the Lord with thanksgiving. So you might ask yourself, how do I approach Scripture? Am I listening to the Spirit as I'm reading? Am I asking God to show me my need? Am I including him at all? The Spirit might be calling you to be humbled or encouraged. He might want you to be comforted or even confronted. Verses 10 and 11. His delight is not in the strength of the horse, nor his pleasure in the legs of a man, but the Lord takes pleasure in those who fear him and those who hope in his steadfast love. Check your pulse if this does not challenge you and ask the Spirit what he might be asking you, might be saying to you in these verses. To the original reader, the strength of the horse or the legs of a man would conjure up images of war, instruments used to gain security and even peace. Think of a war horse or a battle-ready soldier. Any king would definitely put their hope in it, that power, that strength, but not God. We see here that God isn't impressed by what we possess or what we can achieve. He's not looking for us to be strong or powerful in these ways. He delights in our weakness, in our understanding of who we are in light of him. He's calling us to fear him. The creator of the cosmos, the healer of wounds, he's inviting us to hope in his steadfast love. These words should inspire reflection and prayer. You might ask, Holy Spirit, is this me? Do I live in fear of you? Am I hoping in your steadfast love? Or am I hoping in my success at work? A better marriage, obedient kids, more me time. God has graciously, graciously shown me over the past few months how my heart often yearns for approval the approval I can get from people enjoying time with me, liking an insight I share, or even a prayer I lift up. It might sound crazy, bear with me, but the Spirit has been so specific to show me that when people agree with me during prayer, with like a yes or an amen while I'm praying, I can feel better about myself, approved. So for me personally, These verses inspire both repentance and rejoicing. The Lord, please forgive me for seeking the approval of others to find my security and peace. And thank you for not desiring strength from me, but humble hope in you and your steadfast love. Lord God, please give me hope in you. Be encouraged. Meditation is relational, it's conversational. Is knowing when to listen, when to pray, when to sit still, when to worship. Feel the freedom and follow the Spirit. This prayerful process might be a shock to your quiet time system. If you're new to meditating on Scripture, it might even feel a little clunky at first, and that's okay. Old habits will pop up, but the Spirit will be there to guide you. I know for me, it goes against the grain of my old habits, definitely. I used to be the guy who conquered the Bible. Every year, I read it cover to cover. And to be honest, on any given day, I couldn't remember what I read. But I conquered the Bible. But God, in his grace, through his spirit, is freeing me to enjoy his pace, to have more fun, and as a visual person, to imagine. 
with a less hurried heart and permission to sail more slowly, I'm suddenly allowed to be overwhelmed with the beauty of God's character and the beauty of his care. Verses eight and nine, he covers the heavens with clouds. He prepares rain for the earth. He makes grass grow on the hills. He gives to the beasts their food and to the young young ravens that cry. Take a moment to linger on those verbs. God covers, prepares, makes, and gives. He produces clouds, sends rain, and provides food. This might inspire you to look out your window while you're reading and be enthralled with creation. Look out at the trees where the birds nest. That's God. Imagine, imagine the water in Lady Bird Lake. That's God. Think about the avocado in your taco. That's God. The Psalms are ripe with wonderful imagery like this for us to celebrate. So as you meditate, prayerfully, humbly meditate, look for images that ignite hope. Underline, journal, and reflect. When you hit something like the raven, take a moment to think about it. Where else do scriptures talk about the ravens? You might be reminded of the words of Jesus, who taught that the ravens neither sow nor reap, and yet God feeds them. Of how much more value are you than the birds? Suddenly God providing for the ravens speaks to his kindness, his love, and care for his people. Next time you see a grackle, praise the Lord. Be creative and studious. Read and reread. Look up words you don't understand. My kids do this all the time. They often lift their eyes from their book and say, what does this word mean? Be like that. What does this word mean? Be like that. Be like a child. Ask questions. And it might sound a little strange. Bear with me. It might sound strange. But sing what you learn. For about two months, my younger kids became obsessed. And that probably is not a good enough word. But they became obsessed with the soundtrack to Aladdin. Every time I walked into the house, it was blaring upstairs day and night. A whole new world. You never had a friend like me. Soon enough, it stuck. We were all singing Aladdin songs, everyone but my wife. I was going to sleep singing them. I was waking up singing them. I was accidentally meditating on them day and night. It's no wonder God uses a songbook to share these truths. He wants them to sink deeply into our hearts. So if you feel led, practice with Psalm 147. Sing these truths. In just 11 verses, we've been reminded that God is worthy of praise. He heals the brokenhearted. He's abundant in power. He cares for his creation. He lifts up the humble and delights, delights in those who hope in his steadfast love. The very fact, the very fact that God delights in us should inspire song. We need truths these truths etched on our hearts to strengthen our faith. Because when we step out our front door or turn on our phones and see a much different picture, these truths can be very, very difficult to hold on to. Verses 13 and 14. For he strengthens the bars of your gates. He blesses your children within you. He makes peace in your borders. He fills you with the finest of the wheat. Now, some of you might hear these promises originally given to the people of Israel and might agree wholeheartedly. You might even be enjoying them right now. You have a safe home, a thriving family, and food on the table. But for others, it's not the same story. I think of many of our friends at M2 who struggle financially, who have life threatening health conditions and see people with the same skin color as their own unjustly murdered or separated from their families at our country's borders. For people struggling like this, these words might be much more difficult to believe. So how do we respond to verses that claim God protects, blesses, makes peace, and provides when you struggle to have children? You've been laid off. 
You live in fear of sickness or suffer chronic illness. Your marriage is failing or you simply live each day feeling vulnerable, unprotected, and forgotten. How do we respond to those verses? The answer is faith. When we can't see the truth of scripture with our eyes, we must ask God to help us embrace the truth by faith. Faith is believing even when we don't see and it pleases God. Remember, he takes pleasure in those who hope in his steadfast love. I personally get to see this sort of faith lived out in my sisters in Christ at M2, and I marvel. I see this in my friends Yolanda and Deirdre. They are very honest with their struggles. They don't diminish them, but they cling tightly, defiantly even, to the promises from God in the midst of hardship, and my faith gets built up through them. God builds up my faith through my sisters in Christ. Then I get the privilege of joining them in prayer for the the things they hope to see God do in their lives. Psalm 22 is a great example of this. David is intensely suffering and he cries out to God in his distress, but over and over and over again, he pivots back to trusting in God's character and promises. That's real pain and defiant faith on display, and it's beautiful. So memorize psalms like this. Lift them back up to God in prayer for yourself and for others. Lord, your word says you protect our cities. Bless our children. Make peace in our land. I confess to you that I don't see it right now, but I hope in you. I trust in you. I ask that you help me believe even more and make it happen for the glory of Christ. For the past two years, I've struggled with sleep. Some nights I hardly sleep at all. But Psalm 127 reminds me that God gives to his beloved sleep. So I have a choice to make on sleepless nights. One, not believe it. Two, ignore it. Or three, believe that this is a promise I can trust and pray for whether I receive it or not. I get to hope in faith in God's promises. Personally, I like option three. Now, is all this easy? Not at all. Faith is a fight. Meditating on the Psalms will be a fight. Temptation towards pride, distraction, and unbelief will be waiting around every corner. But remember, God is with you. God is with you. And he loves you. And the ultimate proof of that, Psalm 147 crescendos with a nod to his ultimate act of love and kindness. Verse 19, he declares his word to Jacob, his statutes and rules to Israel. God numbers the stars and cares for his creation. Yes, but to his people, he breathes his word. Nothing else in all of creation gets this kind of treatment. God wants his children to know him and to walk humbly and uprightly alongside him. Once again, absorb the intimacy that this verse portrays. God has pursued us with this word that is so comforting, yet, if I'm being honest, It's also convicting. I don't know about you, but during this quarantine, I haven't always heeded the truth of God's word as I should. I found myself desiring to work more to find worth, being impatient with my kids to find peace, or distracting myself to find comfort. God's loving act of declaring his word has exposed a fatal wound in my life left by sin. God knows this about me. God knows this about you. He knows this or knew this about Jacob, mentioned here, who lied, cheated, and stole his brother's birthright and the blessing of his father. Yet, as you might recall, God didn't treat him like he deserved. In his grace and sovereignty, he chose Jacob, a sinner, 
to carry on the promise he had given to Abraham to bless the nations through Jesus. Ultimately, we, like Jacob, have been fatally wounded by our sin. But where God's law exposed this wound, God's son came to heal it once and for all. First Peter says, Jesus bore our sins in his body on the tree that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. By his wounds, you have been healed. Our hearts weren't just broken, they were dead. And Christ came to eternally heal us by taking our wounds upon himself and dying on the cross for our sins. He did what neither Jacob, Israel, nor we could ever do. Christ, the word himself, became flesh and lived in perfect humility, perfect fear of the Lord to heal our broken hearts and bind up our wounds through his brutal death and glorious resurrection. When you read the Psalms, look for Jesus. And when you struggle to believe God's promises, look at Jesus. Paul says in 2 Corinthians, for all the promises of God find their yes in him. Now that's good news. Delight in it. Meditate on it day and night. Thank God for it. Give a shout of praise. Go old school and shout hallelujah. Humble yourself. Give out a hallelujah. It's no wonder a song of praise to God is fitting and pleasant. Our greatest wound left by sin and death or our sin and death has been healed through Christ. Our greatest wound has been healed. So let's respond in obedient faith. What is true for Israel is indeed true for us, the church. He has dealt, not dealt thus with any other nation. This is not cause for boasting, but for humility and delight. Remember, we're like Jacob, sinful and in desperate need, but we've been made new by God. So let's ask him to lead us. Humbly ask the Spirit a third and final prayer. Holy Spirit, create a response to you. Holy Spirit, create a response to you. This might start personally. The Spirit might be calling you to be honest with him. Get real with God. Are you hurting or angry right now? Bring your pain to the healer. The Psalms are full of laments and pleas for mercy. Find one and lift it back up to him. His understanding is beyond measure and he already knows what you feel and what you need. So don't let your pain distance you from Christ. Bring it to him and let him bind your wounds. God might be calling you to repentance. Are you treating his word like a chore right now? Are you ignoring it? Are you walking in pride or placing your hope in other things besides his steadfast love? Confess your sin. Men, women, brothers and sisters, Confess your sin, bring it into the light, turn from it, and enjoy the delight of your heavenly Father. Confess and repent and enjoy his delight. Don't do this alone, though. Do it in your fight club, your city groups, with your friends, with your spouse. Maybe God is calling you to respond in worship and thanksgiving. This is fun, just do it. Take a walk, thank him for his creation. Turn up some worship music and sing. Take a verse out of the Psalms and make it a new song. Take two verses and two truths and put them together. God numbers the stars and heals the brokenhearted. God numbers the stars and heals the brokenhearted. Say it, sing it, believe it, it's true. God numbers the stars and heals the brokenhearted. Finally, Respond outwardly by loving others. Very practically, know the Psalms to share the Psalms. The best prayers have already been prayed, so memorize them and plagiarize them. Take God's word and pour them over your friends, your coworkers, your neighbors, your church family. Church, look around. The people need prayer these days. Pray the Psalms. Meditate on these Psalms to remind those around you that the Lord is their shepherd 
Psalm 23, that there's nowhere that it can go from his presence. Psalm 139, the Lord is their keeper, protector. Psalm 121, and that he adorns the humble with salvation. He adorns the humble with salvation. Psalm 149. Ultimately, share the Psalms to share the gospel. He has not dealt thus with any other nation. They do not know his rules. The church, like the people of Israel during this time, has been given a gift that no one else possesses, the truth. And like Israel, we are meant to live by this truth, to be a light to our neighbors, to be a light to the nations, a beacon of hope in a dark world. The world needs to know that there is a God who provides, protects, heals, gathers, and breathes his word over them. They need the self-inflicted wound of their sin exposed so they can turn to Christ and be healed once and for all. They need to know that they're not forgotten, that there is a powerful sovereign king who rules the cosmos and desires to heal them by his wounds. I need that. You need that. The world needs that. So let's, as a church family, meditate on these truths, then go and tell them the good news. Let's pray. Father, just even looking at this psalm, Lord, what other place can we be but truly humbled by your might, by your power, and by your love. You're powerful and you're personal. Your understanding is beyond measure. Lord, we're, I ask that we be overwhelmed by you. Lord, um, we need your word. We need your word. And I ask, Holy Spirit, that you would, you would stir up a hunger for your word in our church. Lord, there's several people, um, I'm sure, that feel distant from meditating on Scripture. This idea sounds abstract and so far off. The idea of meditating on a day and night and delighting in it seems almost unattainable. And I ask, Holy Spirit, that you bridge that gap, that you compel them to your word. I ask that you speak to them mightily. Lord, draw those who have been far from your word to hear your voice. Slow us down, humble our hearts, and open our ears to hear your voice. Lord, give us insight into your word. Show us our need and create, us a, create a response in us to these words that we've even heard today in Psalm 147. Lord, we ask all these things because we cannot do them. We can't muscle up enough strength. We know that this is not what you're asking. You want us to hope in your steadfast love. So Lord, make us people that fall at our feet and ask to, for your help and hope in you. Lord, I ask that your spirit just move in our church, draw us near to Christ. And Lord, I do ask that you would fill us up with these words to pour out on others, our neighbors and the nations. Lord, I ask this for the, for the glory of Christ. Lord, I ask that more eyes lift up to see the beauty and the majesty of Jesus who has healed our wounds through his life, death, and resurrection. And I pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen.
Join me in our confession and assurance. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed. By what we have done and by what we have left undone, we have forgotten the goodness of your word. We have abandoned our praise to you. We are truly sorry and humbly repent. Because of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us, that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your name. Church, hear the good news that we have in Christ. While it is true that we have sinned, it is a greater truth that we are forgiven through God's mighty grace in Christ Jesus. To all who humbly seek the mercy of God, I say in Jesus Christ, your sin is forgiven. Thanks be to God. Let's praise him.
Sending as we are sent out in the mercy and grace of Jesus and strengthened by his spirit. Praise the Lord, for it is good to sing praises to our God, for it is pleasant and a song of praise is fitting. Have a great Sunday.